Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and welcome to The Post 15. Followership. Not fellowship. This is not our dipping into the Tolkien universe. That will probably be another vlog. But today we're going to talk about followership. And this vlog comes via request from an extraordinary, extraordinary woman. Extraordinary physiotherapist, remarkable researcher, remarkable human. And she also happens to be a really great mate of mine, Dr. Sue Charlton. Hi, Sue. Now, just as I left my last job as dean, I was asked to do a seminar on leadership. It's weird. I'm asked to do a lot of lectures and things on leadership. Really don't know why. But during this wonderful session, met wonderful people. It was a, a tremendous gig. The legendary Sue asked me a question. She was brilliant in this seminar and the question that she asked me has provoked me mm, for about the last five months. She explained to me, to the group, that something odd appears to be occurring in the remarkable charity that she founded, that she runs an amazing charity that focuses on children and particularly children's health. And every year when they do a call for grants for funding, Sue was getting confused because the applications would be dominated by people wanting to create leadership programs for kids in primary schools. So Sue wanted to know what was going on here and I think that's a really great question and she followed up with this truly great question do we want a group of little leaders exiting our primary schools end of quote now that statement stayed with me and I've spent the subsequent months thinking deeply about it and thinking about what sort of literature I can learn about and deploy to try and explain what is occurring here. Now, there's no doubt about it that leadership is a big word at the moment. Leadership training, leadership professional development, leadership is everywhere. There's no doubt if you're not a leader, then you're on a short list to get into a leadership program. So yes, leadership is an issue, Frequently, leadership is a problem, but leadership is not an identity. It's a collection of behaviours and practices. Leadership must point to something. It must be a pathway to something. To have a leader, though, requires that you have followers. And it is stunning how little theorization there is of followership. And if you think about it, any leadership goal or mission or vision, whatever noun is popular at a particular time, that vision must be shared with followers. It must be believed by followers or else nothing will actually happen. And I think We've seen the consequences of that, those of us that have lived through the last decade, indeed lived through the last 25 years, have seen the impact of what I call the empty chair of leadership. Someone's supposedly there, but they're not really there. And that person is lacking credibility. They're lacking authenticity. So the followers know that, and so they don't follow. And then nothing actually happens. And if you think about it, that's why we've all lost belief in the big ideas about public health, public education, public libraries, public good, working for the community to enact positive, productive change. And we are in difficult times. So I promised you when we started this new series that we would explore some difficult alternatives to try and create a better pathway to a better future. Now, I had some knowledge of followership. I finished a Masters of Leadership. I finished a, a Masters of Leadership last year. But to give you some sense about how small this literature is, of all the courses I did in that Masters of Leadership, only one week in one course had any readings, any mention 
of followership at all. And that gives you some sense about how bonkers this focus on leadership actually is. But our job through this series, I promised you that we'd go on this journey together, that we would try and construct and find alternatives. So let's do that. Let's do that today and have a think about followership. It's a small word, it's a small literature, but it just might be a beacon to our future. Now, there are thousands of books, millions probably, billions of blogs and publications and articles exploring leadership. And even when followership is talked about or mentioned, it's investigated through the lens of leadership. So what I'd like to do is let's disconnect these words for a while, they'll come back together near the end of this post this week, but let's disconnect the words for a time and think about what's happening in this space. I also want to log that the word follower is changing in its meaning. There was a great book by Rory O'Connor who explored obviously followership in social media. So you have the binary opposition of influencers and followers. Oh yeah, no. Nah. Yeah, nah. But so the word follower and followership is changing a little bit through its social media inflection. And you'll see there are many reasons and other words that are used in the leadership literature when they're trying to talk about followership but don't. They talk about workers, they talk about staff, they talk about employees. But if you think about it, every single workplace is dominated by followers not leaders. But bizarrely, this leadership training remains the focus, even in primary school. And the word followership, it doesn't sound right. It sounds like it is from Tolkien, really. Most of us, most of the time in our lives, have to do what other people tell us to do. And yet, there's so little work, energy, heat, around organisational culture, how they may thrive, but also how they may decay, how they may die. Because supposedly, if we can just get the leadership right, <laughs> then the organisation will thrive. Yeah. Now, I think as we've seen in the last 25 years or so, that is completely and utterly wrong. When we think of followers, as Brown and Thornborough showed in a really early article in the early 1990s, so when we think of followers, we think of passivity. We think about yes men, yes women, low status, lack of responsibility. We think of sheep. We think of people who are alienated. But that's again completely wrong because when we become a follower, that is active. That's a decision that we make. And the binary opposition between leadership and followership is not as clear as it appears at all. Powerfully, Brown and Thornborough stated that, get ready for this, quote, organisations do get the followers that they deserve, end of quote. Therefore, if followership is neglected, my goodness me, there will be consequences. If followers are only studied or researched in relation to leadership, then it's going to restrict, it's going to truncate our very understanding of work, of leisure, and also of life. And look, sporting metaphors do work well here. Pick a sport, whatever game you're talking about. For someone to have scored a goal, someone has assisted them to score that goal. So the assist is part of the success. We move to the legendary Star Trek, why not? Would Captain Janeway be as fabulous as she is without Chakotay? What would Kirk be without Spock? What would Picard be without his number one? Now, Robert Kelly is the international expert on followership. He's a brilliant scholar, and I recommend his book, The Power of Followership, to you. So when followership is added 
to an organisational vocabulary, the focus suddenly becomes on active and independent thinkers who are able to build teams, are able to innovate, able to collaborate, and who know how to achieve shared goals. Now, I think it was James Morosis who was able to, this is brilliant, create a sense of what a skill set is for a follower. And James described it as response abilities. Two words, response abilities. That's brilliant. So to possess the ability to respond during a crisis, during a moment where something has to be done. So followership in this new model activates an openness to learning, a desire to be interactive, to share knowledge on the job and learn, continue to learn through reciprocal sharing. How fabulous is this? So adaptability becomes the crucial skill. And if you think about it, that's the crucial skill of our time. Digitization, globalization, accelerated modernity. No leader could single-handedly manage the speed of the change. So the capability of followers to adapt and build partnerships, build collaborations at speed, these are actually the key skills of our time. So this is exciting. And while the literature on followership is small and it is a bit patchy, there's some amazing work there that's based on some very deep thinking. The consequences of not understanding followership, to be frank, we can see because we've ended up in our present. Isn't it going well? <laughs> of pretty toxic, brittle leaders who create disconnected, disrespectful followers who show up to get paid and the point of work is to start so you can stop as quickly as possible. So this model of followership is derived from the really old models of leadership, often called charismatic leadership, and it's still and transactional leadership as well. And both of those still dominate our public private sector, our governments, and obviously our schools and universities as well. The assumption is, oh wow, that there's you know people have a destiny to be a leader. You know, we have a person that you know that phrase, born to lead. People are born to lead. They're strong, they're confident, they're aggressive. Yeah. Now, of course, the world has been filled up with all these people. And, of course, their confidence was and is overconfidence. Their strength is actually bullying. Their aggression is pretty damn toxic. And the notion that they were born to lead reinforces so many of the injustices of the past, of race, of colonisation, of age, of gender, of religion. So therefore, positive organisational behaviour really requires us now, today, to focus our attention and our emphasis and our priority on the follower. Yeah. If there's a reason that we've lost so much trust and faith in our leadership. I think it's because there's been a lack of attention and care in creating a communication system between leaders and followers that is based on trust, integrity, and decency. Also verifying a, a sense of the strengths and the weaknesses of all parties. But this is also about empathy, organisational transparency and diversity beyond virtue signalling. Yeah. So any diversity, any diverse views in our organisations, that comes from followers, not leaders. And any diversity that becomes part of the organisational culture occurs in the communication system between followers and leaders. So as you can see, this is amazing, isn't it, this literature? When we 
make a decision to put attention on followers, we all as citizens, as much as scholars, start to understand what's actually gone wrong in the last 25 years or so. And there is another way that we can live, that we can work, that we can think. And this was highlighted by Ulbin, Riggio, Lowe and Carsten. And they argued the time has come for a movement away from leader-centric organisations, interesting phrase, and moving to follower-centric organisations. So what this phrase means, hang on to yourself, is that it's followers that actually create leadership. Followers create leaders. So without followership, leadership doesn't exist. And it's only constructed when fo followers are summoned. Now, this is the important bit, isn't it? For something so important. Think about how rarely in your working lives you've heard or thought about the word followership. And now, think about what that says about leadership. That's pretty frightening, isn't it? And there are different modes of followership that may be useful for your thinking. There's a couple of models I particularly recommend to you. The first is from Robert Kelly's model, and he offered four types of followers. Firstly, the sheep, passive, dependent, needing extrinsic motivation, needing to be supervised all the time. The yes people who are dependent, not active. The second group are the pragmatics. So they follow the views of the majority, they stay in the background and they won't take risks. Thirdly, a big group, the alienated. These are the negative people. They're trying to bring the group down through constant critiquing and questioning of the group and its goals. And finally, there is the star, the star follower. They're the highly independent people, very active. They can be trusted to complete tasks, but they also interpret and analyze and think about deeply the goals of the organization. Yep. Now, Kelly's analysis is pretty interesting there. I think that's spot on. And I'm sure you can recognise yourself at different points of your career and a stack of other people through that model. There's one more that's useful too, and this is from Barbara Kellerman. And she uses the following model. She has the isolates. So these are the detached people, don't care about leaders, don't care about responses, just hashtag don't care. Then there are the bystanders. They observe but do not participate and they make a conscious decision to disconnect. Then we have the participants. They're active, they're engaged, they either agree or they disagree with the leader, but they invest time and energy in making an impact. We also have the activists, eager, energetic, engaged, and they're heavily invested <laughs> in people and processes. So this group can either do profound good for the leader or can actually pull the leader down. Yep. And then finally, we end up with, again, a very large group in the contemporary workforce, uh, the diehards. These are the people that are prepared to die in the ditch for their views. They can be incredibly, I would argue problematically, but incredibly devoted to leaders, or they can get ready to chop their head off at the first opportunity. So their life is completely consumed by one view and one perspective. Wow. Now again, I think we can recognise ourselves and we can recognise other people in that model. But that's great, but how do we move beyond the sort of characteristics, the description of followers? How do we move from that to create a better organisational culture and therefore create a better society? And therefore that's why we need to think about followership, we as researchers, we as citizens now, have to think about outcomes, what's important, and how we all collaborate to get there. 
Now, you know, let's ask an important question. Why is public health in the, is in the state that it's in? Well, it's in the state it's in because all the attention has been on public health leadership rather than the people at the coalface doing the impossible work, including during a pandemic, to understand public health followership. Yeah, I've supervised so many theses on public health leadership around the world. I've never supervised on public health followership. And that's why we're in the mess we are in. So as you can see, followership is not a lesser role to leadership. It's not passive. It's not a preparation for leadership or that promotion. It's not a way to hang on to yourself, manage up. Oh, I hate that phrase, manage up. It's also exclusive of leadership. So leaders must remain followers. The best leaders must remain followers. So followership, therefore, is a way of thinking about the distribution of power. It's a way of thinking about work and particularly what is meaningful in the workplace. It's a way to create an inclusive workforce. It's a way to diagnose incompetent leadership. And it's a way to provide a context around leadership beyond personal ambition. Okay, now Karuna Shankar Pandey stated that followers create executable power. Now, power does little except to initiate fear and disconnection. But if something is executable, then that demonstrates the importance of listening and thinking. So followers make power meaningful and appropriate and actionable. Yeah. And the importance here is about building relationships and building communication systems between listening and thinking. This is good stuff. So therefore, I wanted to conclude the post this week, and thank you for being with me on this. This is big. This is big. This could be our future. And I wanted to finish with a couple of stories, if I can, this week. Firstly, I need to do a shout out to my friend, to my colleague, Professor Jackie Hewitt. Now, you met the wonderful Jack. I've known Jack in, God, 28 years. You met Jack uh, in the last vlog series right near the end. And Jack, as she always does, offers a very strong critique. She has a very strong critique of my work on fellowship, followership this week. And she's absolutely right, because Jack argued there's a huge space between leadership and followership and what happens in that space. There are people that occupy that space in radically different ways that may be part of institutional goals or just completely disconnected from them. And Jack is right. That binary opposition, followership and leadership, is too simple to understand work. And the binaries are made even more problematic, obviously, because all the attention is on leadership and so little is on followership. So Jack has quested me with the desire to understand what's happening in the space in between. So I'm calling this the Homi Baba third space, third space of leadership, which I think that's a phrase or a trope I've just invented in response to Jackie's commentary. So the vlog we're doing next week is a really intricate one, not on leadership, not on followership, but the group of people, which is probably most of us, that at this juncture are simply holding space. Now, I think it was Jackie Hewitt, in collaboration with Jamie Quinton, who created a new word, spacership, not leadership, not leadership. That's a bad word. I can't let you two play without supervision. So it's not spacership, we'll think about the space in between. But my final point also that I wanted to bring forward an argument that we explored right from the start of this new vlog series. I never knew it would be as big a deal as this, and in some ways I think we're probably reaching the end of the first arc of the post, moving into something new, and I don't know what that'll be, you will tell me. But we've talked through the, the vlog series so far a lot on Baudrillard's double refusal. The refusal to lead, the refusal to be led. 
So what's happening is we've got, as we know, I mean, this is just obvious stuff. We've got dreadful people in positions of power who have no idea what they're doing. And we have evidence, so much evidence to show day after day, they don't know what they're doing. And because they are incompetent, the population is turning away from them. They're disconnecting from them, often with a fair amount of disgust attached. And that's why we've had all the weird events that have emerged in the pandemic and post the pandemic. So, you know, people fighting over toilet paper in shops, right? Wow. The truckers in Ottawa, the occupation of Wellington and Aotearoa, New Zealand earlier this year, and of course the January 6 insurrection in Washington. Now, most of us as active caring citizens have disconnected from our leaders because we do not trust them. They are not credible. They're brittle and they do not know what they are doing. Now, this situation about weak leaders is made even worse because weak leaders hire weak followers around them. And that's certainly what's happened in our universities. And these leaders, uh, are attempting not to be found out because they're hiring these weak followers around them. We've seen that. And I'll give you an example of this. This happened to one of my best friends. She, and I'm, I'm her referee. Last week's look, I'm her referee. And she applied for a DVC post, Deputy Vice Chancellor post. She is amazing. She is just such an inspirational human. Her qualifications are astounding. She is a brilliant human. It is a privilege to walk the earth with her. So she had all the requirements for the DVC, everything well above what they required. But the vice chancellor, <laughs> and you're probably ahead of me, dear viewer, the vice chancellor was an internal appointment. So you know one of those appointments where, you know, we, we look through the world for a great vice chancellor and unbelievably we've appointed the bloke who's just down the corridor isn't that amazing yeah it is so it was an internal appointment and this bloke decided not to progress my friend's application for a dvc role because and you need to hang on to yourself and this was in writing he didn't progress her application because she is research active. And he stated that the DVC post was, quote, an administrative role, end of quote, and the person in it should not have research activity. Now, obviously, when my friend and I Skyped, she was very, very upset. And I was sort of speechless. I'm still a bit... Really? But you see what we're learning about leadership here? He did not want to be shown up by a follower who accidentally happens to be a woman as well, right? So the thing about being research active as a leader in our universities is that it shows that you're willing to be tested, to put your ideas out into an international environment, go through peer review, go through review, and you've got rigor, you've got transparency, you know what you're doing. So why would any human on the planet actively select a deputy vice chancellor who was research inactive when a research active one was available? The answer is, of course, the double refusal is in place, refusal to lead, refusal to be led. And this vice chancellor did not want his DVCs to build authentic relationships with followers to show they're doing research, respecting your research, that this is an interrogative, transparent space. Instead, he wanted a local administrator who was satisfied to remain in their experience of this local environment and not develop new modes of expertise. Right, so the consequences of these decisions are absolutely disastrous. Decisions about teaching and learning, decisions about research, the consequences of these decisions will take generations to wash out. To make a change in this absolutely disastrous situation, to get out of this double refusal, means that all of us have to make different decisions 
in our lives. Now, Kurt Maiden described this role as the, quote, synergetic follower, end of quote. The synergetic follower was the way to change the world because we have to live a life of integrity, of honesty, of decency, of openness. We have to commit to personal and professional development and we have to be courageous. We have to listen. We have to learn. We have to connect. We have to collaborate. We have to speak. We have to intervene. We have to know when to be silent. In tough times like these, it's really difficult to be in work <laughs> and it's really difficult to be out of work. So we have to remember that the choices that we make every day are really important choices. So all the way through while I was writing the post this week, I was obviously thinking about the Bird's great song in Easy Rider, right? Wasn't born to follow. Great track, can I say. But of course, no one is born to follow because no one is born to lead. We are made. We're not born. And we are here to make meaning. That's what life is, making meaning. And it seems appropriate to finish today, not with the birds, but with the man who wrote a lot of their biggest hits and also every now and again did do some singing with the legendary Roger McGuinn. And you know I'm talking about the Bob, Bob Dylan. And Bob's great lyric, all of us gotta serve somebody. Service has value. Service is important. But you know what? We get to choose who we serve. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.